This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Egypt's declared three days of national mourning after at least 300 people were killed in an attack on a crowded Sufi mosque in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula Friday. Egyptian officials are calling it the deadliest terror attack in Egypt's modern history. More than two dozen attackers wearing military combat uniforms detonated a bomb inside the mosque, opened fire with machine guns on fleeing worshippers, set cars ablaze to stop people from being able to escape. Among the victims were at least 27 children. Officials are blaming the attack on a militant group linked to ISIS. This is Mohammed Abdel Fattah, the imam at the Al Radwa Sufi Mosque, describing Friday's attack. About two minutes after I climbed onto the platform, I heard what sounded like an explosion outside the mosque, and then some people came inside firing at all the worshippers. Of course, as soon as people heard the firing, they all started to run. Some people climbed onto the platform. I saw them piled on top of each other, and they, the assailants, were hitting anybody and everybody, anybody who was breathing. I didn't see their numbers. I didn't see what they looked like. I could only feel their presence inside the mosque. Over the last year, ISIS-linked militants in Egypt have also repeatedly targeted Coptic Christians, bombing two Coptic churches and opening fire on a bus headed to a monastery. Within hours after Friday's attack, the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, appeared on television vowing revenge for the attack. Only minutes later, Egyptian warplanes carried out multiple airstrikes in the desert of the Sinai Peninsula. The military says they were targeting militants fleeing the attack. The military and police will return security and stability with absolute power in the coming short period of time. This is our retaliation. We will respond to this attack with brutal strength to encounter these terrorist extremists, the Takfiris. For more, we go to Cairo, where we're joined by Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif Abdokadus. Sharif, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you lay out for us what you understand happened on Friday and what has been the response since? Well, it's as you described it. Uh, about 25 to 30 militants uh, arrived uh, as the sermon, the Friday uh, prayer was taking place. Uh, they arrived in five, uh, five four-wheel uh, four drive vehicles, positioned themselves outside the main door in the 12 windows of the mosque, and uh, set off explosives in the mosque, and then began opening fire on the worshippers uh, who were trying to flee. Um, uh, they, they torched several cars outside to prevent people from escaping. They fired on ambulances uh, that had arrived on the scene. And we have this horrific death toll of 305 people killed. Uh, so this uh, very, very highly coordinated attack. Uh, all indications point to uh, the Islamic State affiliate in Sinai as being responsible for this, although there hasn't been an official claim of responsibility. Um, and uh, it looks like there, there are largely two reasons why this mosque was targeted. Uh, one is, in the past year, um, as the Islamic State has has uh, targeted Sufis in the area, uh, most notably um, killing a, a leading Sufi religious scholar, uh, beheading him and posting pictures of it online. Uh, there is an ISIS commander also who singled out that area of Sinai as being uh, one of the places where Sufis live uh, that, the, that the group would uh, wanted to or intended to eradicate. And um, there have been reports, several reports have come out now that Militants have stormed the village uh, several times, as recently as last week, warning the residents uh, not to allow Sufi rituals to take place there, but also uh, not to coordinate with the police and the army. Uh, the tribe from that area, the Sawarka, are in conflict with the Islamic State. So that, is, that also uh, looks like it was a main motivating factor for them to attack uh, this area. And with all these threats that have been uh, being made against uh, this, this, this village, uh, the residents themselves had reportedly set up their own civilian checkpoints to try and protect themselves. And even so, this attack seems to have taken place with relative ease uh, by the militants. And uh, we have this, this very bloody uh, death toll. And this is a village of only 2,500 people. So you're talking about nearly one in 10 people uh, from this village, from this community, being killed. And there are reports now they're being buried in, in mass graves. The media often refers to Sufism, Sharif, as, um, as a sect, a minority group. Can you talk to us about this religious group? 
Right. I mean, when uh, you, you, sh you shouldn't even really say a Sufi mosque. I mean, most people wouldn't identify uh, that uh, in that way here. Uh, this was a, a mosque that was frequented by Sunni, uh, by Sufis and uh, non-Sufis alike. It had a center where Sufi rituals were practiced. Um, Sufis aren't a sect of Muslims. Uh, they're not a minority group. Uh, they're an integral part of mainstream Sunni Islam. Um, for centuries, uh, Sufism has been accepted as an integral part uh, of mainstream Islam. Many leading theologians are Sufi. Uh, the head of Al-Azhar, Egypt's, uh, Egypt's top Islamic authority, is Sufi. Um, so calling the Roda Mosque a, a Sufi mosque is, is a bit misleading. Uh, it was frequented by Sufis and non-Sufis alike. Uh, and uh, this was also a fact that I'm sure the uh, the attackers also knew they were they were killing uh, Sunni Muslims, and this may uh, and this is why this was very shocking. It's the first major militant attack on a Muslim congregation. Uh, it, it marks kind of a new phase in and the, the, in who they're targeting, and it may in some way uh, uh, change. Uh, you know, uh, public anger may increase towards them uh, in Sinai to, that, that would help uh, in this conflict. Can you talk about who is the IS affiliate in Sinai and what is Sisi's strategy in Sinai? And talk about it just for people who aren't even familiar with the map, how Sinai fits into Egyptian politics. Well, Sinai is a, is a peninsula that is attached to mainstream, um, mainstream Egypt. Uh, it's uh, technically in Asia, not in Africa. And this was occupied by Israel in the 1967 war. Uh, and uh, uh, up until 1979 or 1980, when they withdrew out following the peace treaty. Um, but the, the, uh, the region has seen a lot of uh, militancy, uh, especially in the last few years. Um, the Islamic State affiliate that we're talking about uh, really is the outgrowth of a group called Ansar Beit al-Maqdis, which first appeared on the scene in, in, in Sinai in um, uh, 2011. Uh, back then, they were attacking mostly uh, Israel. They were attacking a gas pipeline that led to Israel. Um, and um, they stepped up their attacks, as, as did other Islamist militants groups, in 2013, following the uh, overthrow by CC of uh, President Mohamed Morsi in July of that year. Uh, and they began attacking police uh, and military installations, uh, claiming responsibility for several high-profile attacks. Uh, then in 2014, uh, they pledged allegiance uh, to ISIS. Uh, they called themselves Wilayat Sina, or the, the Sinai province. And we saw since then a ramping up of these large-scale attacks on civilians. Uh, they claimed responsibility for the downing of a Russian airliner in 2015 that killed all 224 people on board. Uh, they've launched a very violent campaign against Egypt's uh, Coptic Christian minority over the past year. Uh, we've seen bombs ripping through churches in Cairo and other cities that have killed dozens. Uh, and now we see uh, this, this latest attack, the first of its kind, uh, on, on, a, on a mosque. Hmm. Um, Sharif, on Friday, President Trump tweeted, we'll be calling the president of Egypt in a short while to discuss the tragic terrorist attack with so much loss of life. We have to get tougher and smarter than ever before, and we will need the wall, need the ban. God bless the people of Egypt. That was President Trump's tweet before he called Sisi. Can you talk about the U.S. relationship with Egypt, Trump's relationship with Sisi? Well, uh, Trump, uh, the U.S. relationship uh, with Egypt has long been one of uh, unquestioned support, uh, with uh, Egypt as the second largest recipient of aid uh, from the U.S., second only to Israel. And uh, that support has continued through successive uh, uh, governments, so through Mubarak for 30 years, uh, through the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, through Mohamed Morsi, um, and now through Sisi. I mean, there's been slight variations, but essentially uh, the support has always been there. Um, and, uh, you know, the Sisi, in response to this, as we heard in that clip, said he'd, he'd respond with brute force and he would avenge the martyrs. Um, and already, you know, we've, we're hearing of airstrikes happening in Sinai. But this is really a continuation of the same, same exact kind of approach uh, a conventional warfare security approach that uh, is failing and um, and is maybe exacerbating the crisis. I mean, much of Sinai already has been under emergency law since 2014. Uh, there's tens of thousands of soldiers there. 
uh, there's, there's army tanks, there's helicopters, uh, there's uh, heavy armor that's been deployed in the area. And despite all of that, uh, there's been tangible, very few tangible results. Um, uh, you know, the, the government keeps claiming every day, uh, you see almost every day in reports and newspapers of militants captured and killed in Sinai. Uh, if you go to the Facebook page of the army, they've claimed by now to have killed about 3,000 militants, which is much more than they originally said existed. Um, but it's impossible to verify these claims. Journalists are not allowed to go to Northern Sinai, haven't been uh, for over three years now. Um, so it's very hard to understand what is happening on the ground. And meanwhile, Egypt uh, and Sisi is spending billions of dollars signing these massive arms deals uh, for everything from uh, German submarines uh, to Russian helicopters to French fighter jets and uh, an aircraft carrier. Uh, and I mean, first of all, this is a country that is suffering an economic crisis and spends very little on health care and on education. Uh, but secondly, critics say that you know, th this is, these are weaponry that could be used in conventional warfare and is not applicable to this kind of counterterrorism conflict that they're facing. And finally, um, you know, the, 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 the support of the local population in Sinai is key uh, to winning this kind of conflict, but uh, the military has engaged in uh, very heavy-handed tactics, uh, and, and uh, local tribes there and residents of Sinai have long felt discriminated against, but this latest campaign has been particularly brutal. Uh, there's been these indiscriminate military tactics that have resulted in civilian casualties. There are multiple accounts of, um, of uh, extrajudicial uh, um, executions uh, and arbitrary arbitrary detentions and torture. Uh, houses have been razed and people forcibly displaced. Entire villages uh, have been destroyed. Uh, the treatment at uh, checkpoints by military and police of residents is notoriously uh, bad. Uh, the phone service, mobile phone service, is regularly disrupted. And so, um, um, you know, people who oppose the militants uh, are reluctant even to support uh, the, the army and the security forces because uh, because this is the way they're being treated. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the militants themselves uh, brutally intimidate the residents uh, against uh, collaborating with the army and police. And they, they come in, they'll kidnap someone uh, and dump their decapitated body on the streets to terrorize the residents. And so the people of Sinai are really stuck in this conflict, and they're the ones who are really suffering. Mm. Sharif, um, before we go, I wanted to ask you about a recent uh, high court decision, Egypt's highest appeals court, upholding Ala Abdel Fattah's five-year prison sentence, plus five years probation um, and a massive fine. The ruling final can't be appealed, served three and a half years of a sentence already, so he'll spend another year and a half in jail. Um, can you explain um, who he is, his significance, and what this means for other protesters, also the situation for journalists right now in Egypt? Well, Ali Abdel Fattah was a leading figure of the 2011 uprising uh, of the revolution. He was uh, a leading thinker and, uh, and a very respected uh, uh, figure. And I think that's why he was uh, targeted so uh, viciously by uh, the government. He's been imprisoned under Mubarak. Uh, he was uh, imprisoned under the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. He was uh, arrested, uh, issued an arrest warrant under Mohamed Morsi, and now he's been in prison now for about three and a half years of his five-year sentence. That was the final appeal. I was at court that day, and uh, it was rejected. So he's going to have to spend at least another year and a half in prison. He's also facing another trial, which uh, the verdict is set for December 30th. Uh, where he faces more years in prison. And even after he gets out, he has five years of probation. And what probation means here in Egypt uh, for someone like Ala would be spending 12 hours a day every, every night in a police station. He'd have to go in at 6 p.m. every day, spend the night there, and he, he gets out at 6 a.m. So really, another, that's, you know, another five years of half of that being detained. Uh, so, that, so that's very difficult. Uh, with regards to uh, the state of journalism, I mean, after the, um, the attacks on Friday, the official state information service uh, issued, uh, you know, sent out a statement to all the, all the foreign press. And in it, uh, it included a warning to international media outlets and to human rights organizations basically saying that uh, if we don't tow the government line, uh, that we're considered, quote, partners uh, to terrorism. Um, 
And of course, I mean, the, the, the regime here has come under widespread criticism uh, for its dismal human rights record. I mean, it, it, this is kind of the, the worst wave of repression in Egypt's modern history. They jail activists and journalists and human rights uh, workers, and uh, there's multiple accounts of forced disappearance and torture. But, um, and CC has used this war on terror and attacks like these as a pretext to clamp down on political freedoms. And just in the past few weeks, Amy, there's been another wave of arrests. A very prominent activist called Mahinur Masri uh, was detained. Uh, a prominent secular blogger was detained. There was a wave of arrests, uh, almost unprecedented, targeting the gay community. Um, so, so all of this is happening, and yet the military uh, uses, uh, or the government uses these attacks to threaten or warn uh, human rights organizations and journalists. And finally, uh, we should just remember that while Friday's mosque attack was the deadliest terrorist attack uh, in, in Egypt, uh, in Egyptian history, it wasn't the deadliest incident. Uh, the most violent incident came in August of 2013, when the army and the police dispersed a pro-Morsi protest, killing uh, between 800 and 1,000 people. And just go on with that for the, our last remaining minute. Explain what happened then and how that informs Egypt today. Well, that was a, a mass sit-in by supporters of the ousted President Mohamed Morsi uh, in a district, in two separate districts in Cairo. And uh, the police, and uh, backed by the army, came in and uh, brutally uh, opened fire. Uh, there's been multiple uh, reports on this and multiple accounts. Uh, we don't even know what the exact death toll is, but uh, I was there that day, and uh, it was, for me, the bloodiest incident I had witnessed, and I've been uh, in something like five different wars now, uh, and that one day was the bloodiest I had ever seen. Uh, we're talking about the killing of uh, at least seven, I think the official is at least 700, but it's probably somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people uh, in a matter of hours in one, one space. Uh, so uh, this is one of the worst uh, state uh, mass killings uh, since Tiananmen Square, or maybe the worst since Tiananmen Square. And it's not something that the government uh, or the country has really come to terms with, and it's something that, uh, that, that you know, that, that, that kind of ended the revolution. Uh, many people took to the streets initially, didn't agree with the Muslim Brotherhood, and they weren't supporting the Muslim Brotherhood sit-in. But once you can kill that many people in a day, that kind of was the first time that the government and the army really had full control back, and the revolution was, was pretty much crushed. Sharif, I want to thank you for being with us. Sharif Abdel Kadus, Democracy Now!'s correspondent in Cairo, Egypt. He's a Nation Institute fellow. We'll link uh, to what you write, uh, Sharif, at democracynow.org. When we come back, showdown at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in Washington. Who will show up for work today as its head? Then we speak with two not-so-traditional Democratic candidates who won their races in North Carolina and Virginia. Braxton Winston uh, became famous in Charlotte, North Carolina, with his raised fist in front of a police line protesting police brutality. He will now take his seat on the Charlotte City Council. And we will speak with Lee Carter, a Democratic Socialist, former Marine, who unseated the Republican majority whip of Virginia's legislature, known as the Virginia House of Delegates. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.